Well, good morning, church. I know you're used to that video before the message, but uh, this week we just don't have one and we have another one for Easter. But uh, as we're getting ready and getting ready to open the word, uh, every time someone is baptized in our service, uh, like Misha was, we give them a standing ovation and just kind of welcome them in. So let's stand up and uh, welcome Misha. It's awesome. So good. Uh, so, so, so good. So I'm going to tell a quick, I'm going to tell a quick little story on Misha. So uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, we had a junior high, kind of a junior high summer retreat where we take our middle schoolers uh, to a camp for a week. And our youth pastor, Will, uh, he had only been with us, I don't know, a couple months or something like that. And, and he got COVID. And so he called uh, Lee Cox, our executive pastor, and myself. He's like, I have COVID. I can't go on this middle school retreat. And we're like, well, yeah, you can go. We didn't say that, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and we're like, okay, well, I mean, it was like last minute. I mean, just boom, got it. And we're like, okay, well, certainly we can find somebody to go on this middle school retreat. And uh, we were calling people left and right. It was the summertime, so we were calling, you know, guys that we knew were teachers that had the summer off. And I mean, everybody was a no, 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 no. And uh, I think it was Addie, my wife. She was like, well, why don't you go? I was like, no, no negative on that. Like I've done my time in middle school camps. Like I'm not going back to a college dorm and the smelling it. No, 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 no. God does not want that. And she's like, well, you know, maybe you should pray about it. I'm like, no, thank you. I don't want to. Well, you know where this is going to go. I ended up going on a trip and I didn't know Misha. You know, I'd kind of seen him around church, but I didn't know him. And I got to know a group of awesome middle school students in that week. And I was so glad that I was able to go that week. And I remember that that's when Misha started to, to talk about like his decision. Like I may want to get baptized, I may want to get baptized. I got to know his dad, Sam, uh, come to find out Sam and I grew up like literally blocks from each other. And uh, Sam was telling me, yeah, I grew up in East Akron. I'm like, no way, you know? And, and I said, you know, I, my dad, like my parents were divorced when I was young. I'll tell you a little bit more about that story. Uh, actually later in this message, my parents were divorced when I was young. So my mom lived in this suburb of Akron and my dad lived in East Akron and what's called Goodyear Heights. And I was like, oh, I used to play baseball. I, you know, and he said, did you play at Barber Elementary? That's my elementary. Yeah, that's exactly where I play and all these common things. And then we see it like months and months and months later, I get this text yesterday. Um, from Will and then Austin Seavers was on the text. Some of y'all know Austin, uh, but it was about, hey, Misha's gonna get baptized tomorrow. I was like, look at that, look at that. You know, what? what is Jesus up to in your life? Like, what is Jesus up to in your life? What is Jesus up to in your heart? You know, we're coming into an interesting season. It's the Easter season. And it seemed like we just had Christmas because Easter's early. So I thought we were just talking about Jesus and being born and Christmas and Easter, boom, next week, here it is. And today is what the church refers to as Palm Sunday. You know, some of you are like, I know what Palm Sunday is. Others of you, you know, you're journeying to Jesus. You're maybe new to Jesus. You're like, what? Like Palm Sunday is what is, you know, Hawaii have to do with Jesus? What do palm trees have to do with Jesus? You just don't, the, the Palm Sunday thing hasn't quite made a connection. And we get that. And so Palm Sunday is just simply what the church calls the Sunday before Easter. It's the Sunday that marks Jesus coming in back into Jerusalem, uh, initiating the last week of his ministry and quote his life before he's crucified. You know, that's the Good Friday. And then before the Sunday that he defeats death and he's resurrected. And I don't know where you are in your journey with Jesus. I don't know if you've been a believer of Jesus for a long time now. I don't know if you're just coming to believe in Jesus. I don't know if you're coming back to Jesus or if you're investigating Jesus perhaps for the first time in your life, but this is a unique season. It is the Easter season. Given that this coming Sunday, a week from now, we will celebrate Easter, what we wanted to do in these two weeks is this week we wanna focus on the cross. And so today we are going to go into the end of the gospel of Matthew and we are going to look at the crucifixion of Jesus. And then next week we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus saying in these two weeks, this one line, Easter changes everything. Easter changes everything. The crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. It's not just a season where we welcome in spring. It's not just a season where I get to eat my favorite candy, which is a Brock's only jelly bean. Just Brock's. 
Don't get creative on the jelly beans. Just give me the old jelly beans. It's not just a season where we start to see bloom. It's not just a season where, you know, all our schools take spring breaks and you're crazy if you jump on Interstate 77 or Interstate 75 this week. You're just crazy. You're just asking for misery to join the spring break travel. It's a season where Easter changes everything. The crucifixion, the resurrection, they change everything. So today, today is going to be difficult because we're going to go into the scriptures and we are going to look at the details of when Jesus was sentenced to murder, to torture, to serve as an eternal sacrifice for sin. And we are going to ask the question, why? Why did Jesus have to endure the cross? Why did he have to go to the cross? I mean, he was the son of God, whether he went to the cross or not. So why the cross? When asking the question why Jesus had to endure the cross, we were reminded of a verse that is written in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned and fallen short of God's glory. You've sinned, I've sinned, we've sinned, they've sinned. Every person that's ever walked the face of the planet except Jesus has sinned. They have disobeyed God. They had willfully chosen separation from God because of their own pride, because of our own selfishness, because of our own temptation. We have all fallen short. But it goes on, verse 24, Romans 3, it says, and are all justified. That's a legal term that means to be declared not guilty, not guilty by what we have or have not done. Is that what it says? It's not what it says. It says by his grace, by his grace, God's riches at Christ's expense because of what Jesus has done for us. It says through the redemption that came by Jesus, not because we were good enough, not because we got enough good things, not right. Not because we've done this, this, and this, and this, and this. No, by his grace, we've all fallen short. Why was Jesus crucified? Why did Jesus have to endure this cross? Because we fall short. Because we sin. Because we've been disobedient. And the only way for us to be forgiven of sin and be restored into a right relationship with the Almighty God is through faith, through trust in Jesus as the Son of God who went to the cross to pay the ultimate price for sin. That's the truth of the gospel. That's the heart of the good news. And so today is gonna be a little bit difficult because we're gonna look at the details of the crucifixion in Matthew chapter 27. And I don't know about you, maybe you've never read of the details, maybe you have, but every time I read of the details of crucifixion of Jesus, it makes me cringe. It makes me cringe. I mean, even if we were to take the spiritual reality out of the crucifixion and it was just a random person in human history that was being crucified, it would still unsettle us. It would be gut-wrenching. I mean, we would feel it in our stomach, say, oh my goodness, what torture. But then when we come to see that this is the Son of God who willfully chose to endure the cross for our sake, well, it does. It's hard to read, hard to read. As we open up Matthew chapter 27, I'm gonna encourage you to get scriptures in front of you, whether that's your Bible app on your phone, whether that's a Bible in front of you, whether you brought your own Bible, but this is going to be detailed. But scroll Matthew chapter 27, the end of the first gospel we come to in the New Testament. Scroll down to verse 27. Before we read verse 27, It's important to note that Jesus has already been arrested. He's already been arrested. He's been placed on unfair trial. People have made up lies about him. People have come in with fake testimonies about him. He has been accused of saying that he is indeed the king of the Jews. The religious leaders have come. Religious leaders have come and they have begged the Roman authorities, begged the Roman authorities to sentence Jesus to be crucified. Pilate, the Roman governor of this region, remember, the religious leaders, the people of Israel, they are conquered people by Roman oppression, by the Roman government. The Roman governor, Pilate, has at this point washed his hands of the situation. Even though he's been warned in a dream by his significant other not to have anything to do with it, he's washed his hands and he has now handed Jesus over to be crucified. We pick up the, the details in verse 27 of Matthew 27. 
It says, then the governor's soldiers, so these are Roman soldiers, they took Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. All right, now let's picture this scene. Jesus, the son of God, is placed into this public setting known as the praetorium. And Roman soldiers are now encircled around him. And these Roman soldiers have been commissioned to torture him. How are they going to torture them? This is gut-wrenching. So just a warning here. It says in verse 28, they stripped him and then they put a scarlet robe on him. And then they twisted together a crown of thorns and they set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. This is all out of mockery. And what did they say as they mocked him? Hail, king of the Jews, they said. This is all intentional. This is all intentional. They place Jesus in the center to be the center of attention. They take his clothes off him. They put a scarlet robe. That detail scarlet is on, is on purpose because it is the royal color of the Roman Empire. They place that robe on him. They take this crown of thorns. They place it on his head to mimic Caesar. They put this powerful scepter, this rod in his right hand to make him look in mockery as Caesar, the most powerful man in the world at this time. And then they, all these soldiers, they, they bow down in unison on a knee in a circle around Jesus. And what do they choose to say in mockery? Hail, King of the Jews. Well, if Caesar walked into their presence, what would they do? They would kneel and they would say what? Hail Caesar. This is mockery. This is all mockery. And they're Roman soldiers. They choose to do this. Now, they take it a step further. It goes on to say they, they would spit on him. Verse 30, they spit on him. And then they took that staff, I assume the staff that Jesus was holding, and they struck him on the head again and again, not once, not twice, five, multiple times. Verse 31, they continue to mock him. They continue, now this is all, real quick, this is all what took place before Jesus was crucified. Now, perhaps you've read the Gospels before. How many criminals were crucified alongside Jesus? Two, okay? Is there any mention of them here in Matthew's gospel? Not, not at this point, it's not. And actually, a little spoiler alert, Matthew does not really mention these criminals. I know some of y'all read the gospel, they're like, yeah, but there's one criminal on the cross that asked Jesus to remember him when he came to his kingdom, and then Jesus said to that criminal, hey, surely you'll be with me in paradise today. Well, that, that's not Matthew's gospel, that's another gospel. But there's no mention of these two criminals at this point in this praetorium. They didn't feel the need to mock them. They only felt the need to mock Jesus. They go on, they spit on him, and they hit him again and again with this staff. Verse 31 says, after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him, and then they led him out to be crucified. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced Simon to carry the cross when Jesus could no longer in his own strength carry this cross. Now, very, very interesting point. Every time we come to Christmas or we come to Easter, you know, the, the, the narratives within the gospel are so strong relating to the birth of Jesus and also to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And maybe you've, this is the first time you've ever really read through them. Maybe it's the 50th time you've ever read through them. One of the things that I like to do as somebody that's familiar with them is I pick something out that I investigate. So a couple of years ago, I started to investigate Simon of Cyrene. I was like, I wonder, like, does he show up anywhere else? Like, I mean, it's so interesting that he's mentioned not only by name, but where he's from. So the gospel writers, they have to know something about this guy. They didn't write, hey, and then a random guy, they made pick up the cross and carry it. They, they, they put him by name and even give where he's from. And so I started to investigate and come to find out that he and his sons, Rufus and Alexander, are actually mentioned in Mark 15. And church history would hold that the three of them became followers of Jesus. And they are a part of the early church. I mean, the text is so deep when we get into it. And so Simon is forced to carry this cross. Verse 33, it continues, they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Why would Jesus refuse this ancient painkiller? Well, there are two things that make up this painkiller, wine and gall. Interesting Old Testament prophecy in Psalm, Psalm 69, it's actually mentioned 
that this would be offered, wine mixed with gall. But we may remember that at the Last Supper, so just a few chapters before, at the Last Supper, when Jesus has his last meal with his disciples, and he institutes communion. Now, we're going to practice communion here in a few minutes towards the end of our service. But we may remember when he takes the wine and he takes the bread and he says of this wine, this is my blood of the covenant, my bread, this is, this is life that is given to you. He drinks of that and then he says to his disciples, I will not drink the fruit of the vine, wine, until I drink it again with you anew in my kingdom. And this is a reminder during the crucifixion, as hard as it is to stomach, it's a reminder that this is, this is not under the control of the Roman soldiers. This event is not under the control of Rome or the religious leaders, that Jesus is in full control of this event. Full control. And so when he's offered this painkiller of wine and gall, he refuses it because he said he's not going to drink of that until he drinks it anew with his disciples. So when we look at the crucifixion, one of the most interesting things about the crucifixion is that there are some 30 Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled in the cruci crucifixion of Jesus alone. Prophecy, Old Testament prophecy, Old Testament prediction after prediction that is fulfilled within the crucifixion. Jesus is the one in control here. I, I want to give you a homework assignment this week which I know homework is a great word, right? So let me give you a challenge or figure out some other word. Let me give you an encouragement this week. Go home sometime this week and read Psalm 22. Psalm 22, the Old Testament Psalm 22. And realize that that Psalm was written 1,000 years, approximately 1,000 years before the crucifixion of Jesus. Let me just highlight one, one or two verses in there. Psalm 22, 16 says this, dogs surround me. A pack of villains, what do they do? They encircle me. Remember how the soldiers encircled Jesus? They pierced my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and they gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them by casting lots for my garments. They gamble for the garments of Jesus. All right, go back. Matthew 27, verse 35. Look at this. It said, when they had crucified him. Well, how do you crucify someone? You pierce their hands. You pierce their feet. Actually, you pierce their wrists. You, pier you pierce their feet. They pierce their feet. They divided up his clothes by casting what? Lots. They gambled for his clothes. And sitting down, they kept watch over them. Pierced them, cast lots, divided his clothes, and gloated over them. All prophesied a thousand years before it ever took place. Old Testament prophecy after Old Testament prophecy fulfilled, not just through the life of Jesus, but actually through the death of Jesus, his crucifixion. It goes on to say this. This is the true mockery. Verse 37, it says, Above the head, they placed a written charge against him. It said, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Now here's the two rebels. They were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. And those who passed by, they decided that it'd be a good idea to hurl insults at him shaking their heads and saying in mockery, you're going to destroy the temple in three days. You're going to rebuild this. Why don't you save yourself? Come down now. Come down now from the cross if, if you are the son of God. Well, isn't that ironic? Because the reason that Jesus chooses, chooses to not come down from the cross is because he is the son of God. And as the son of God, he is the only one that can endure this cross so that anyone who would come to believe in him as the son of God could be forgiven of all sin and be restored into a right and forever relationship with God through faith, through trust in Jesus. And so Jesus is in control, so he chooses not to come down from the cross. Now the religious leaders are going to say something. In the same way, verse 41, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, they decided, well, we're going to mock him even more. He saved others, they said. He healed the blind. He healed the sick. He healed the lame. He walked on water. He calmed the storm. He'd done all these miracles. He had helped all these people, but he can't save himself. Hey, he's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. No, they won't. No, they will not. But Jesus is choosing not to come down from the cross. Verse 43, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, those rebels who were crucified with him, they also heaped insults on him. Then verse 45, these Roman soldiers are going to be reminded that this is not just another 
crucifixion. But there's far more to this. Verse 45, it says, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, where have you gone? Why have you forsaken me? Did you know that this is the only time in the Gospels, the only time in the Gospels that Jesus does not refer to God as his father? The only time right here when he's on the cross. He chooses the distant, my God. Where are you? Why have you forsaken me? If you've ever read the Gospels, you'll be reminded of how often Jesus refers to God as his father. I I remember the time when he was 12 years old and they go into Jerusalem for the Passover and and he goes to the temple and he's conversing with the religious leaders in the temple, the teachers of the law, and Joseph and Mary, they kind of lose their kid. And they find him and they're like, why have you done this to us? And he said, didn't you know I had to be where? In my father's house. Again and again and again, Jesus will refer to God as his father, except when he hangs on the cross. It's the only time he says, my God, my God, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? We believe the reason he says that is because that is, that is Jesus take on the full weight of sin. And God, his father, allows him to take the full weight of sin and sin separates us from God. So at that moment, at that moment, I don't know how to describe all this to you or explain this all theologically, but at that moment, some way, somehow, Jesus felt a complete disconnection from God as the weight of our sin, of all sin, was placed on him. He goes on to say this, verse 47, in conclusion, when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. The Old Testament prophet Elijah, immediately one of them ran and got a sponge and look what he filled it with, wine, vinegar, and he put it on a staff and he offered it to Jesus to drink. Of course, Jesus is not going to drink that. Verse 49, he says, the the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if the Old Testament prophet Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, it was at that moment that Jesus gave up his spirit. It's tough to stomach, isn't it? It's even tough to read. It's tough to think about. But as we anticipate Easter, let's ask a very, very important question. What what do we believe to be true about Jesus? Uh, Allow me to to go far more personal. What, What do you believe to be true about Jesus? What do you believe to be true about Jesus? You see, Easter changes everything. The crucifixion, the cross, the resurrection of Jesus, it it changes everything. But it leads us into a time where we have to ask ourselves the question, what do I believe to be true about Jesus? Do I believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God who was given to all humanity, that anyone who would come to believe in Jesus as the Son of God, that they could come into a right and restored and forever relationship with God through faith and trust in Jesus. What do I believe to be true about Jesus? What what do we believe to be true about the cross, about the crucifixion of Jesus? Do we believe that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that anyone who would believe in him shall not perish, they not, shall not face the eternal consequence of sin, which is eternal separation from God, but they could have life both now and forever because of what Jesus has done for them. What do we believe to be true about Jesus? You know, I, I think as it relates to the cross, I think a prophecy that was written 700 years before Jesus says it best. Isaiah 53, verse five. It says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions, He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we have been healed. By his wounds we have been healed. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 
the Christians who were in Corinth. Later on in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, to be sin for us. Why? So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Now, this word righteousness is a very churchy word. And it confuses us sometimes. We're like, righteousness. What that word means is so that we could become in a right relationship with God through faith and trust in Jesus. What do you believe to be true about Jesus? Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, who was an incredible follower of Jesus, but was also a very flawed man. You know, as we look to the Passion Week and as we look to the crucifixion and the resurrection, I mean, you think uh, of what Peter did during that time. I remember when, when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, you may have read this before, you know, Peter decides he's gonna stick up for Jesus and he takes a sword and he cuts off the servant's ear. His name is Malchus. And then Jesus does one of his most instantaneous and coolest miracles. He just picks the ear up and places it on the, on the side of the guy's head and he heals him there. But then Jesus says to him, hey, Peter, if I need a legion of angels to come to my attention, all I have to do is call him. I'm choosing this. Peter denies Jesus three times after he's arrested. Next week, we'll talk about the resurrection when Peter runs to the tomb upon the resurrection. But Peter, later in the New Testament, he writes this, carried along by the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. He took our sins in his body on the cross so that in him, so that we might die to sin and live in a right relationship with God, righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. A few months ago, I saw a picture. It was about four months ago. I, I saw a picture that, that uh, it, was, it was online and so a buddy of mine sent it to me through text or something like that. And I saw this picture and, and I looked at the picture. I'm like, is this real? And, and I smiled in almost like disbelief when I looked at this picture. And it was a picture of, of a person that, that I kind of grew up imitating on Saturday mornings. And, uh, you know, I, was, I, I grew up in the 80s. So I, my generational demographic is I'm either the youngest uh, Gen Xer there is or I'm the oldest millennial there is. So I was born in 1980. So generational studies, I like fall in between two generational demographics. And so in the 80s, there was something that was on TV on Saturday mornings that uh, was terrible, but just a lot of people watched. I don't know why a lot of people watched it, but I kind of grew up uh, kind of not idolizing this guy, but thinking that this guy was larger than life. Uh, I shared with you earlier, and I've shared with you a time before, that my, my parents divorced when I was really, really young. And so uh, my, dad, uh, my dad passed a couple years ago. I uh, love my dad, but my dad had a lot of struggles in life, no doubt. He had struggles in life. And when my parents got divorced, he really struggled. And so we were supposed to have split custody, you know, where we lived with my mom, my sister and I lived with my mom, and on the, every other weekend we'd go to my dad's. But my dad struggled with some things. And so it wasn't every other weekend. But maybe it was one Saturday a month or so, uh, we'd get to go to my dad's. And we'd go to my dad's and we, we'd watch television on Saturday morning. And then after watching television, uh, we would beg him. There was a 7-Eleven not far from his house. So we would beg my dad, my sister and I would say, hey, can we go to 7-Eleven? Let's go to 7-Eleven. All we wanted to do was get ice cream and they had a pole position car racing game. You remember this, uh, the Atari game? And it was a pole position car where you got into the arcade and then you had a little steering wheel. And I remember you had this four speed thing. And my dad would always say, okay, Jace. He would always call me Jace. He like, let's go ahead and choose the automatic transmission. And I was like, no, sir, I I want it. Like, I got to get the whole experience. And I get in there and he'd pump quarters into this pole position thing. And I'd be wrecking all over the place. And this was all Saturday morning. But I remember on Saturday morning, we go back to his apartment and we would watch this guy who seemed to be larger than life. And then after we'd watch him, my dad would let us do WrestleMania in the living room. My dad didn't care about the furniture. So I'd climb up on the corner of the furniture of his couch and I'd be like, off the top ropes. And I would just fly onto my dad. My dad was a big guy. I know you won't believe this, but my dad was like 6'4", 225. He's a big fella. Well, a couple months ago, I saw a picture of a guy. Right? And the picture was this guy giving his life over to Jesus. And his name is Terry Jean Bollea. 
And I looked at this picture. I'm like, no way, no way. Terry Jean Bollea decides to go all in with Jesus, decides to get baptized with Jesus. And there was even a video on Twitter. I don't know why Twitter changed their name. It's the stupidest thing in the world, but it's Twitter. And, and, and they show the video and this poor, this poor, you know, guy that's baptized, you know, I mean, he's just struggling, you know, struggling. He's baptized and he comes up and this guy's name is Terry Jean Bollea. Do you know who I'm talking about? Well, let me show you this picture. You remember this guy? This is like December. Hulk Hogan decides to give his life over to Jesus. And this is literally what he said in an interview after he said, total surrender and dedication to Jesus is the greatest day of my life. Total surrender and dedication to Jesus is the greatest day of my life. My friend, what do you believe to be true about Jesus? What do you believe to be true about Jesus? Do you believe that he is the one and only son of God? Do you believe that as the one and only son of God, he was the only one who could endure this cross so that anybody that would come to believe in him as a son of God could have the forgiveness of sin and the gift of life both now and forevermore. Not because of what we have or have not done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. Have you decided to go all in with Jesus? What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, it means we turn to Jesus. It means we choose to believe in Jesus. It means that just like Misha did earlier in our service, that we confess our belief in Jesus as the son of God. And yes, it means we take our next step in our journey with Jesus and we are baptized Following the example of Jesus, we are baptized into our relationship with Jesus. Let me ask you this. As we anticipate Easter, have you made your decision to go all in with Jesus? Perhaps you haven't. But we want to be very, very clear with an invitation today. If you would like to take your next step in your following of Jesus and your belief in Jesus, and you would even like to take your next step to be baptized into Jesus, I know you didn't plan on this this morning, but perhaps today's your day. All you need to do is we're gonna conclude our service with communion and a song after service, you can just come on down here. We'll have people that are part of our team down here and you can say, you know what, I didn't plan on this, but I, 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 I wanna get baptized today. We got shorts, we got t-shirts, we got everything that you need to get baptized today, today. Why not? Why not? Well, maybe you're like, I just need to talk with somebody about that. That's great. We'd love to talk to you about it. And you're like, but I, what about me getting baptized next Sunday at Easter? Uh-huh. No better Sunday to get baptized at Easter Sunday. And we got people that are already scheduled to get baptized. It, let me just be clear on this. What do you believe to be true about Jesus? And as you take a moment to reflect on Jesus, what's your next step in your journey with Jesus? Don't dismiss it. Total surrender, total dedication. Hulk Hogan said it was the greatest day of my life. That's crazy. Off the top ropes. Here we go. <laughs> it's a journey with Jesus. And we pray that you're either on that journey or you'd be willing to begin that journey because we will not regret it. Let me pray for us. Lord, we love you and we're thankful that you endured the cross for us. Lord, we don't know how to make sense of all of it, but Lord, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will lead us in our heart to fully believe that you are indeed the son of the almighty God who paid the price for our sins so that we could be forgiven and be restored to a right relationship with you both now and forever. And we don't have to have it all figured out. You don't expect perfection on us. It is by grace that we have been saved. It's your grace and it's your love. So Lord, may your spirit move and hearts this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.